one chance, one life, one take. Little room for mistake. Who do you? Hello, and welcome to the Dead Funny Dead Serious podcast. Today, we are interviewing the People's Memorial Association. They're in Seattle, Washington, and we have a few people here. Beverly, Amanda, who are you and what do you do? I'll go first. Uh, My name is Amanda Stock, and and I was recently promoted to the executive director here at People's Memorial. I've been with the organization for about three years now, um, and I'm really happy to be here. Thanks for having me. And I'm Beverly Trick. I'm the communications manager for People's Memorial, and I've been here for the same amount of time because Amanda hired me right after she got started. So I started as the admin, but I've now been in the communications world for about a year. Excellent. Excellent. And who would like to begin with what People's Memorial is? Yeah, so some of the, I think that's also like really well reflected in the advocacy side of the organization is because the education certainly is a huge part of what we do. But, you know, the um, the advocacy side is pretty essential. You know, we're pretty proud of the, at least in the last 10 years, you know, we were big, uh, largely involved in the implementation of that designated agent law here in Washington before marriage equality was passed on a federal level. It was a big game changer, especially in Seattle. And then more recently, uh, SB 5001. Obviously, we had a hand in or two to try to increase funeral choice. And we're like a little bit proud of that. And you should be. And can you explain that real quick for anybody that doesn't know? Sure. Amanda, do you want to give the uh, broad strokes on that one? Yeah. So that is the bill that legalized natural organic reduction, um, recomposition, or human composting. And the other option is alkaline hydrolysis or aquamation. And that is essentially um, water cremation. So both of these options are more eco-friendly options. And they just sort of add to our palette of choices for what is done with our body after death. Um, People's Memorial actually um, was trying to push the legalization of alkaline hydrolysis for a few years but it just really wasn't gain, gaining any traction. And so we were really grateful when Repose and Katrina came along because um, there was a lot more attraction over natural organic reduction. And we sort of combined both of these options in one bill and that got it passed. So it was uh, really an interesting journey to see that, that process happen, yeah. It was excellent to even just watch you all doing that, just FYI, from the from the stand, I guess. Uh, as the testimony was really powerful from folks in the community. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah it's, it's really important to have the advocacy piece, it sounds like, and having Katrina Spade. Uh, so we just want to, you know, give a shout out there, which is also in Seattle. And so we do have this little hub, it sounds like, of, yeah. of advocates. What do you think? We roll deep. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's another like really awesome thing I think about PMA's history is our members are our advocates for choice at the end of life. And we're biased, but like I I really think what happens here affects the rest of the nation. Like this is definitely the the hub when it comes to progress in the funeral industry. And I think um, it's it's with what's going on with all these wonderful organizations that are here, and then and PMA is very much part of that history, if not sort of the beginning piece of it. Yeah, eighty three years mm-hmm. of doing this work, and we look good, don't we? For eighty three years, you look great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyone that's listening uh, to the podcast should just hop on over to the YouTube so they can see how fucking good these people look for eighty three years of working at this, just working on it too. Right. Um, So you've been doing all this work, you get this far, and you were saying that things have changed uh, and what you need to be advocating for and educating for and financially what people are asking for. What is it looking like? This is being recorded at the end of 2021. What are we looking at? Oh my gosh. The first thing that comes to mind for me, at least, is something Amanda and I've been like, really pushing up against and having to dig deep on is um, cremation. This, like, our organization is really heavily uh, associated with cremation and for good reason. Um, You know, that's the far and away most common choice between um, death care options that our members choose with our partner funeral homes. 
And Washington leads the way in percentages of cremations. We're at about 80%, where the national average hovers at about 50%. So that's, we're pretty cremation heavy culture here, but things are changing with, you know, the uh, availability of alkaline hydrolysis and with natural organic reduction. And people are starting to think like, okay, well, for the longest time, cremation was the greenest option available to us, but let's dig a little deeper and examine, you know, the impact this is having on the environment. And so there's this fascinating, fascinating developments happening where people are asking questions about cremation. But I think that one of the things that we've been talking a lot about is this sort of like default assumption that, you know, because of its affordability and all these other factors that families choose here in Washington, and that there are still cultures and pockets of people that it's really not a good fit for them. And I think that that association between our organization and choosing cremation has um, kind of created a little bit of a barrier for some folks who don't know that they can still access conventional funeral options through our contracted providers, as well as the things that we're well known for. And so, you know, we've really had this sort of reckoning organizationally in the last like 18 months where we're like, why are we still serving so many white folks who opt, who choose cremation, you know, and we're realizing like, okay, this, uh, this really strong association with cremation means that people don't know they can come to us for these other things, or, you know, they have these businesses that they've been working with for generations in their family. Um, like we know that that's a really common way to choose a funeral home is, you know, like, you're not going to know a bunch of funeral homes. You're just going to be like, well, I remember when grandma died, we used that place down the street. And so you'll probably go there. Um, and that's really the case in, you know, more insular communities. And so like historically black funeral homes in Seattle, those, um, the business is really driven by families that are like, yeah, we've always used this funeral home. So like, why would they look anywhere else? And certainly not when they're not looking for cremation, they're not going to turn to us. So it's like, okay, we have these people that are moving one direction um, away from cremation and folks that are moving a different direction away from cremation. And I think for me, that's something that's really interesting. Amanda, thoughts? Yeah, I think as an organization, um, and I'm not sure, Beverly, how long has it been in our history that we've actually, no, I do that I answer the, the answer to that question. So we have these, um, our contracted partners, our, our contracted funeral homes. And up until two months ago, that was the only way that we partnered with funeral homes. And so what that means is um, someone would become a member of People's Memorial to access a reduced price on cremation or burial services. And the way we serve the entire state of Washington is we have partnered with funeral homes across the state that we don't own um, who have agreed to honor that reduced price for our members. And what they get is marketing through PMA and the volume because we have such a large membership. We mentioned earlier over 70,000 living people in Washington. So it, it's a win-win situation for everyone involved. Um, and that has been the only way that we've partnered with funeral homes since 19... 60, no, I'm sorry, it was 60 years since 1939, so whatever that is, um, because prior to that, we only worked with one funeral home. So by working with multiple funeral homes, we're able to have a, a far reach across the state. Um, but so, so that's been the only sort of partnership that we've ever had with funeral homes. But also to, to piggyback on what Beverly said, it's like if we want to be more accessible to other communities, specifically communities of color, then we have to sort of look at partnering with funeral homes in other ways. And um, to be quite honest, that means not always asking a funeral home that's black owned, that's predominantly serving a black community to reduce their prices to meet what we think a funeral home should cost or funeral um, service should cost. So we are currently exploring new ways to partner with funeral homes so that we can support that community. And that means the, the funeral home owner, so long as it's independently owned and not part of a larger corporation. Um, and so just really like totally looking at things differently. And I think that's um, been something really exciting. I'm, I'm a young, I'm the youngest executive director that the organization has had. I'm in my early thirties. Beverly is young. Um, You're the same age. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I'm like, <laughs> thirties. And I think for PMA, we are the youngest staff that this organization has had. And the cool thing is like, we're, we're looking at the way that things have been done and acknowledging that they've worked and, and honoring the history of the organization, but also saying, what can we do to, to bring this organization into the 21st century and to serve 
the community today because um, I, and I, I would imagine any organization with a big long history like this sort of struggles with that. Like, how do you stay true to your mission and to your roots and honor all of that, but also like meet the needs of the, of the community today. Um, and so that's one of the, um, the really interesting and fun challenges I think that we have that we're facing right now. Um, Sometimes it's fun. <laughs> I don't know. It's, I think it's definitely common with other organizations. Like I see some of the stuff that we come up against where we have these like great ideas for ways to like reinvigorate how we can serve folks better. Uh, But I saw this a lot when I worked for Red Cross too, where this is an organization with this just like etched in granite role and, um, you know, reputation in the community and like making changes is hard. And for a membership-based organization, like we get a lot of feedback on every small decision that we make. And sometimes it can be hard to hear that maybe it's not being that well received what your idea is, or, you know, that people are just, they're not on the same wavelength and everybody has different ideas and no one ever hesitates to share them, uh, which is, it's wonderful to have an engaged membership, but, you know, people have these expectations like, well, we've always done it this way. Why would you change it? It's like, well, Sometimes you got to do things a little bit different. The world was a little bit different 83 years ago. And I think in that instance, our um, like superpower is we can go back to, okay, we are, we are here with, we, we've focused on education advocacy and not only educating people about navigating the funeral industry, but maybe also educating our members on why the organization needs to change um, and just letting them know, reassuring them that we, this is in line with our mission. Yeah, it sounds like you're taking the time to observe and investigate uh, where you are right now. And it's the bigger you are, the harder it is to pivot, right? Yeah. Just like, what is that? The cruise ship analogy where it's like, mm-hmm. takes a while and you have to get everybody to be going the right direction, you know, or in the same direction, I should say, there's no right direction. Um, but it, it does, it's a little bit harder and it, it makes sense, especially with all this new, right? Everything's just going warp speed. And so now we have so many more, just by the work that you did, we have two more options for end of life choices than we had a year ago. So now you have four choices. It was hard to begin with <laughs> to pick something. Hmm. Analysis paralysis here. It's going to happen. <laughs> we hear that from a lot of folks who are like, what's the best one? It's right. like, well, there's... That's not really a thing. And also definitely not something that you can do at an educational nonprofit is tell people like, this is the best option. You know, we're just here to empower the community to make informed choices. And um, sometimes it's a little bit tough to get people that information they want because they do experience that. Like, well, how do I choose a funeral home? There's so many. How do I pick an urn? There's so many. How do I, how do I, how do I? And um, yeah, the best you can do is kind of give people the tools to maybe identify what their concerns are and then connect up to the resources that are going to meet their individual needs because there's certainly not like a funeral template that's going to serve every family and every group the right way Um, and I think the funeral industry is very guilty of acting like there is yeah I'll put my cards on the table (laughs) with the hill I'll die on is I just really it frustrates the bejesus out of me that the traditional we call it a traditional funeral right Right. What? The, mm, it's not traditional. Mm. <laughs> I fully die on that hill with you every day. As soon as I hear anybody st- say the phrase, I have to stop them and be like, uh, I understand what you mean by that, but you need to understand we're now calling that a conventional funeral for these reasons. And it's always this awkward thing, but it's like, no, this is a hill worth dying on. Mm-hmm. Like we need to quit acting. Like there's just this inherent value in this like set of decisions. And it's like, big huge death tradition erasure too for whole swaths of folks Mm -hmm. yeah and i'll fight you know i'm I'm gonna be on that hill for ecologically and psychologically sound end of life and the traditional funeral is lacking it is poorly lacking in in those two aspects and for me it is going to be the hill i'm going to die on Mm -hmm. Well, you better scoot over. You'll need to make room for Amanda and I on that hill. Okay. <laughs> You're taking up too much space, Mitzi. Scoot over. <laughs> okay. If you want to find us, um, we're over in Seattle, which is just a big hill, and you can find us and we'll there. All be dead, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, I mean, we're talking a little bit about the challenges there. What are your hopes 
going into 2022 and all this new, new everything? Um, I think one of my hopes, we're trying something new here. Um, I think one of my hopes is that our membership and by membership, I mean the larger Washington community. And then, and then I'll start there. <laughs> start in my own time. <laughs> but I think that I, I'm, I'm hoping that people can see that cremation is not the choice of all families and that's okay. And it doesn't mean if somebody wants a conventional burial or any of these other measures that they're doing something wrong. Um, and I hope that our membership specifically can support some of the efforts that we are taking to ensure that folks of color are accessing the services that People's Memorial provides for the entire state of Washington. And that means financial support. Yeah, we know funeral poverty is on a good day, a huge problem. During an ongoing pandemic, a pretty big problem. Um, and I think that that's been something that we've really struggled to figure out, like how can we reasonably impact this problem? And I think Amanda's right as it's, it's money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And meeting communities where they're at, that's like what I was kind of getting at earlier too. Like with us taking a, a new approach and a partnership with a funeral home. So instead of us telling the funeral home what they should do, it's okay, funeral home, how are you serving your community and what does your community need? And then how can we meet you there? Um, which is a new approach for the organization. So I just hope that our members can see that that's what we that that that's what we want to do and why we want to do it, and that it's a step in the right direction. It's not a step backwards um, because, unfortunately, I think some of the members that I've talked to about some of the ideas that we're working on, they sort of see it as a step backwards. Um, and so, again, it's just about educating people on why we're doing what we're doing and what it means. Yeah, I think Amanda and I tend to focus on different sides of it. So because I'm on the education side, so I'm like the pre-need education side of things. Yeah. And then Amanda's looking at this like at need, what can we do to relieve this burden? And so while she's working on that financing side, I'm working on, um, I mean, most of my job is programming and doing sessions like the Ducks in a Row series you mentioned. We're very well known for that. But this last two years I've been doing programming, we've just had this explosion of other classes to try to address these other educational shortfalls that you know we know our community is experiencing. Before I was the communications manager, I answered the phone. And so I talked to thousands of people about all their crazy questions and all of the wild situations that come up. And I learned so much about what are people concerned about. And so I've been like really trying to use that in a productive way. And one of those things is, you know, we're seeing, okay, well, we do tend to attract certain types of folks, like people that are really into co-ops love us, you know, so we, I personally, I'm like such a hippie and a tree hugger. And I know that there's a lot of kindred spirits at PMA, where they're just like, yeah, this organization built out of socialism, you know, and, you know, people that joined the group health co-op back in the day. And so we have these, a lot of these folks that are really similarly minded, but, you know, there's, um, everybody needs access to this information. So what are the ways we can democratize this information, reach communities and ways, um, like for me specifically, I'm really um, looking at what can we do to connect with people that don't have institutional connections. So, you know, we know we get a lot of referrals from hospitals and hospice and social workers and, you know, but what about the folks just out in the world that don't have those support systems in place? And so I'm working on translating with a partner, uh, working on translating our Ducks in a Row series into Spanish and strategizing about what we can do to make those resources more available to um, non-native English speakers because um, I myself am a medical interpreter and I've had these conversations with folks about, you know, their healthcare and psychosocial determinants of care and the barriers to resources. And there's a lot of overlap with those concerns for healthcare and with death care. And, you know, so I've partnered up to someone else that you interviewed, um, Lupe Tejada Diaz um, from Doula Dam Thing. She and I have been starting to meet and strategize about how we can make this information more consumable and more relevant. And she gave me some feedback that was a little bit hard to hear. Um, one of the things that she brought up is that, you know, for a lot of Spanish speakers and people coming from Latin America, the way that PMA talks about death comes across as cold. 
And I was like, oh, uh, you know, grabbed my pearls, like, how dare? Oh. Um, because by, you know, like a Washingtonian, by an American standard, we do a good job at death by being um, detached and professional and objective, and we don't have opinions, and we're just here to inform. But for people where they've been socialized in communities where death is very much an emotional part of life, and it's embedded into everything, and it's not as taboo to address or to interact with, and, you know, just this entirely different context that comes across as, like, super not invested and super callous, and so she's like, we need to think about that when we're looking at how to present this information to people that are coming from a different cultural background, because what looks successful from an American death care standpoint isn't going to serve the needs of everybody, and in fact, it's going to really turn them off, like, that's not going to make someone want to come talk to you. So I was just like, oh, but I thought I was doing a good job. <laughs> so that's, it's kind of tough. So I think that's one of the ways we're trying to grow is like, what are the ways that we could maybe try a little bit of different things, work a little harder and meet needs in ways that people actually need them met and not like impose solutions. Excellent. Yeah. Feedback is so important for cultural competence. Uh, and being open and again meeting people where they are is it's the work and it's actually heavy lifting so especially with death I mean yeah it's double it's extra have <laughs> extra it's like a dead body mm-hmm. it's dead lifting if you yeah will. it's dead lifting <laughs> it's everything uh and it is right when we're when we're talking about death and dying and just really putting it out there anyway, it's a lot of people have death anxiety and death fear and all this. It's already uh, something that is hard to talk about. And then all the challenges that you're just up against, which is the world. I don't know. The dumpster oh, fire yeah. that has been uh, 2020 and 2021, um, or I'm, I'm going to swear. They're not swearing. I'm swearing. So it's my podcast. But I, I work with a lot of medical professionals uh, in my field. And so they called this year the full circle shit show. Well, <laughs> They're like yeah, dumpster fire 2020, that. full circle shit show. Uh, and the death field really was put on notice. And some of it for the right reasons. Culturally, we need to step it up and figure our shit out and show up in a way that we can hear what needs to be heard. And it sounds like you are facing that. And so I love that you brought that up with your hopes. <laughs> yeah, like, it sounds like, like a freaking challenge, but you're like, yeah. this is my hope. <laughs> you know, we're responsible for like keeping this organization alive and sustainable. Like we're concerned about environmental sustainability, but also like as an organization, what can we do to stay relevant and useful? Because there's no point of having an educational nonprofit if no one comes to you to learn. Like right. if you're a crappy educator, like <laughs> that's not much of a nonprofit. So I think but it means admitting sometimes like, okay, maybe this could be done more effectively, or, you know, maybe there's a way we could do this better. Um, and I think it's been kind of interesting to see the way that's been happening in death care. Um, a lot of our colleagues at other partnering organizations are dealing with some similar stuff. And I think there's been some really beautiful uh, attempts at correcting some of that. Like I, you know, Amanda and I both really love um, the grave woman, Joelle Anthony. She's going right at the root of the tree and trying to change the way death care providers are even trained in the beginning uh, because hot damn, there's some shortfalls in that educational process. And so it's like, we're all kind of tackling these different facets of, you know, where death care needs to grow and change and uh, be more, more effective and inclusive. So that's kind of makes it feel like a little bit lighter of a lift sometimes, <laughs> even when it is a huge project. Yeah, what I hear is you're saying challenge accepted. Oh, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> yeah. 